with that yeah. raised rim. How are you? Hello. Hey, Dylan. Uh, How's it uh, going? Yeah, going well. All right, so I'm just sitting uh, up here. Long time no see. You know? Yeah. <laughs>
All right. This is an audio test. Can you hear? Can you hear? I'm here. Can you hear anything? Oh, you know what I should do when I'm being an idiot? Let me oh, just, that's usual. Uh, yeah, but I'm being more of an idiot than normal. And it's official now because you said it on the internet. Uh, yeah, so, so let me... I mean, normally it's just assumed on the internet. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's, let me remove all doubt. Okay, said you can. They can hear. Okay, all right. great. We'll be getting started in just another minute or two. They couldn't find... Great. Okay. Just hook up the uh, laser pointer. Everything is all about. What do you think? Burn our eyes out. Your uh, the camera's over there. Mm -hmm. so I'll look into it. Uh, look that way. Okay. Yeah, even though the yeah, for some like monitor comes up over here. Yeah, so this is the Zoom meeting here. So if you need any adjustments on that. Here's going to be the PowerPoint. Uh, am I going to see this, the, the small one or the bigger one? This, uh, just because. Oh, that, that's the YouTube. That's the presenter view. That's good. So, yeah. All right. And here's the thing. When you ready, you need to do Hey, welcome everyone. Yeah. Thanks for braving that messy weather out there. <laughs> Not messy A weather. <laughs> this is the Delaware Valley Amateur Astronomers Monthly Meeting, and I'm Jan Rush. And welcome to everybody here and also everyone who's on YouTube. Thanks, thanks for joining us. What what we have out here um, on the screen is a beautiful, beautiful view of the Running Man Nebula. And this has been taken by uh, Daniel Stern, who's one of our members. And it was uh, very special that it was designated the astronomy picture of the day on the 2nd of February. And that's an amazing honor. We're so proud of him. And I think you can see why. It's actually, could someone hit the lights so we can really see how beautiful it is? Thanks. Really amazing photo. From where? Um, I'm not remembering where he took this. Does anyone remember? He did. Uh, Texas, I think. Texas, Florida. okay. Florida. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Born around here. <laughs> Born around here. Down arrow. Yeah. Do I aim it here? Oh, maybe you got it. There we go. Okay. So a couple of nights ago, we had something that the news organizations were calling a conjunction. Uh, not many of us saw it probably unless we traveled because it was really cloudy here, unfortunately. But this is a lovely picture that Harry Orland sent us from Central Florida. You can see uh, Venus on the right and Jupiter on the left. Um, and if you looked on our website, you'd see that it was billed as an impulse. So what was it? An impulse? Or a conjunction. Well, I was kind of mystified myself, so I looked it up. And an impulse is apparently the least apparent distance between one celestial object and another, as seen from a third body during a given period. An impulse occurs when the apparent separation is at its minimum. A conjunction occurs at the moment when the two bodies have the same right ascension. And so for those of you who don't know what right ascension is, think of it as sort of as celestial longitude. So this wasn't quite a conjunction. It's actually an impulse because they are not exactly at the same right ascension. But um, actually on the next day at 11 p.m., they actually, it was a conjunction, but they had set by then. So we didn't see it in our time zone. But just thought you'd like me to solve that mystery for you. Okay, let's go on to forget the past, go on to some of the things that are happening in the future. Tomorrow, we have a beginner astrophotography indoor clinic right here in this room. It starts at 1.30. And it's for DVA me members who are thinking about giving astrophotography a try or those who are try have tried and would just like to get some questions answered and have a little help along the way. 
So it'll be dealing with imaging with tripod and camera, tracking and wide field imaging and planetary astrophotography. And um, we had a lot of uh, people signed up, but if you really wanna come, you can still sign up. And I'm gonna ask Tom to give us a few more tips on what they're going to cover. Hello. Uh, the way this is going to work is we're going to uh, start off with a uh, with uh, the beginning is going to be fixed tripod type photography with, where, where it's wide field photography and what you can possibly get with that and all the variations of things you can actually photograph that way. Then we're going to have a section using the using a sky tracker as shown in that picture and how, how much more you can pull out of the sky with a device like that. We're going to have a section in on planetary Im imaging and that's clues to sun and the moon. And we'll actually go through a whole process point of uh, of taking a uh, a movie of Jupiter and processing it through. And uh, then we'll finish up with some deep sky type photography and what is needed there. So uh, that's tomorrow. And if you're interested, come on out because it should be a lot of fun. Thanks. Hope to see you there. How come he got all the applause? Oh, we give you applause of that. Hey, it's observing season, and we are starting up with our public star parties this month. So the first public event of the year is at Anderson Park Farm Park in Collegeville. Uh, this is Wednesday, March 8th, and I forgot to put the backup date here. The backup date is the 15th, uh, a month, a week later. And Stan Williams and Alan Purdy are the contacts for that. If you would like to help them out by setting up a telescope, you would be welcome. That would be wonderful. If you just like to come and bring the family, that's also a great idea, and you're welcome to do that. Also, in uh, March, we're going to start the Valley Forge star parties that we have uh, every year. These are monthly star parties on Saturday night with a backup date of the following Sunday. And we do them in Valley Forge uh, National Historical Park at the Model Air Plane Field. And all the directions for finding that are on our um, website. So this year we are doing things a little bit differently, a few tweaks. We'll have a couple of captains of each event that will be there to welcome members and um, be sure we have a good contingent of people to help if you wanna bring your telescope and you need help with that. And our captains for this month are Brian Lee, our welcoming chair, John Gaskell and Scott Vanneman, our secretary. <laughs> so, uh, treasure. I'm sorry, treasure. Oh, just gave you a new job. Sorry. I encourage you, although it's not absolutely essential that you register for this event, I encourage you to do that because that's the way you can find out last minute if there are ever any weather related changes. So, if you provide your cell phone number, you'll get a text. If you provide, uh, provide your email, you'll get an uh, uh, email. And also, at, at the last minute, you can always check the website. We'll always have the most up-to-date status on the website. Um, this year, we're not doing a telephone hotline because not that many people used it. So we thought we'd try uh, the website as the main way to communicate with everyone this year. We also have a, a fun event coming up at the Mallon Planetarium. That This is at the Arcola Intermediate School in Eagleville. And it will be run by Adam Chantry, who's a DVAA member. And he's doing a, an event just for us. So <clears throat> the whole night will be free. It will be for members, friends, and family. And the presentation will start out with a view of what's up in the sky and then the actual, the uh, planetarium presentation is on the moons, not only our moon, but also the moons of uh, Jupiter and Saturn and other moons in the, in the solar system. 
We do need you to sign up for that because there is a max of 60 seats in the auditorium, but there's plenty of room. So you're all you're welcome to come to that too. I'd also like to give a membership update. For those of you who are new or maybe people that aren't new, but just need a review of how this works. Our membership year starts in January and ends in December. So everybody's membership expires December 31st of each year. So that means if you're one of the people who did not review, not renew um, on February 28th, you were promoted to expired status. Um, that's uh, There's a grace period there, but you may now, uh, if you didn't renew, you're now considered expired. Now don't, don't worry, we know everybody's busy. If you forgot, you can still go to the website and uh, renew your membership. As of March 1st, we have 198 members. And the other thing I should mention, if you didn't get a, uh, a renewal email, that might be because you joined last year in September, October, November, or December, because for you, your expiration date is set in the following year. So you get a few bonus ones there. But if you, if you uh, need to re-up, visit the website, and uh, we'd be happy to have you as a member. And speaking of membership, I wanted to remind everyone about the forum that we all use called uh, dvagroups.io and encourage all members to register for that if you're interested in the daily um, chat that, that members um, engage in. And that's what you'll see on that site is uh, last minute information about where people are observing on a given night. Um, it's the kind of thing of, oh, let's meet up at Green Lane tonight. Looks like it's gonna be a nice night. Um, and also astrophotography. Many people post their astrophotography there. And you of course can use, can uh, do any topic, but um, what you'll notice is that only, oops, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Only 125 members belong to this forum, and we have 200 uh, members. So that means there's a lot of people who aren't using it. And I encourage you, if you're interested in finding out where people are observing um, on any given night, it is good to register at at the uh, at this for these groups. So in February we had a board meeting, and I'm not going to bore you with all the details. We're going to post the minutes uh, on the website and I'll let everyone know when that is. But a couple of topics might be of interest to you. First of all, um, the raffles that some of you have asked about. We used to have monthly raffles here at the monthly meeting and the um, they kind of fell away during the pandemic and we never got them started again. So people are in interested in doing it, but we thought we'd do it quarterly so that it's not um, so often, and then maybe we can have a better, a more elite group of things to raffle. So the way this works is if you have astronomy equipment or something astronomy related or science related that you don't need anymore, you can donate, to, donate it to the raffle chairman and that person will then um, sell tickets and, and will raffle off the items. And it's usually a lot of fun. I think the tickets are dirt cheap. I don't remember what the actual price was. But they're very cheap. Um, and the other thing is that if some of if there's someone out there who would like to be a uh, chairperson, a raffle chairperson, let me know. It's a very small job. You only have four four times we'll ask you to to do it in a year. And it's a way to get to know other members. Uh, so it's actually fun. So if you'd like to do that, please let me know, and um, we can talk about it in more detail. The next thing is that uh, we are going to have guest presenters for the monthly observing talk for, for the next few months since we don't have an observing chair. So if you have a, um, a topic that is on observing that fits in about a 15 to 20 minute time slot, um, let, let, uh, let me know or Jeremy know and we'll get, get you scheduled for uh, present, presenting that to the, the group. 
We also have a few small cheap tweaks in uh, Valley Forge, as I mentioned to you. And we've decided that Valley Forge star party management is not going to be part of the observing chair job. Um, it really wasn't a, a need for someone to, to doing the logistics of the star parties to be an expert observer necessarily. So we've separated those two things to make the observing chair um, a little more manageable of a position. We also think it would be really good to enhance our um, social media presence. We, we don't have a lot of social media um, interact. Uh, in, presence actually for DVAA. So if anyone likes to do this and would like to volunteer to help us uh, flesh that out a little better, please let me know. And finally, um, DVA merchandise is coming. I won't say any more about it. It's not right, quite ready to go, but stay tuned. And I'll, I'll let you know when minutes of, of the uh, meeting are available. Mm -hmm. oh, you did, great. All right. Our secretary says the minutes are available. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the observing chair. Um, we thought we ought to have a rethink about what that position would be because it, it did grow into a very big job. And I think that uh, makes people concerned about committing to a big, such a big job. So what is the observing chair? It's an experienced observer and DVA member who contributes to the observing experience of other DVA members and the public by, for example, educating club members and the public regarding celestial events, equipment and related topics, contributing website blogs, newsletter columns, et cetera, as, as their interest dictates. Um, provides the observing presentations each month or delegates to someone who can do it. And we think we, we need to make, tap into the expertise of the club in a better way rather than having the same person presenting every monthly meeting, we can have a lot of different topics and, and um, get a lot of people involved. And then of course, review the submissions to the um, Astronomical League for observing certificates and suggest ways to in, enhance observing enjoyment and expertise with DVAA. Of note, the Valley Forge star parties are not part of the remit. And uh, that's a picture of one of our favorite uh, past observing chairs there, Al Lumperty. And it is not required that you have a giant telescope in order to be observing chair. I thought he was just really short. <laughs> <laughs> So if this sounds like you, give it a think and let me know. Okay, let's go to our chair reports. First with Brian Lee for our welcoming committee, from our welcoming committee. Hi, I'm uh, Brian Lee of the uh, Welcoming Chair. Uh, for this month, we have four new members, so we're kind of dropping off. I don't know what's happening here. Uh, <laughs> usually, it's it's like more like uh, half a dozen to a dozen. Um, so that, this month, please help me welcome uh, Carl Patrizio, Sarah Marley, Harold Lucas, and Richard Chappelle. Um, I don't think any of them are in attendance tonight, but welcome. <laughs> And is there anyone here who's um, here for the first time? A couple people. Great, welcome. Okay, we have a report from um, Barry Johnson from the Light Pollution Abatement Committee. This committee kind of continues in the background, but they they still do their work. And so Barry sent me this uh, report. But they still are, they have had three requests this month for assistance on uh, light tr trespass, trespass issues. And also uh, the Westchester University held the uh, meeting of the Dark Sky Committee and they're planning for Earth Day uh, 2023, which will be held at uh, Westchester University. Okay, Bill McGinney.
Thank you, Jan. All right. So this is going to be the probably the last pitch for the spring trip. If anyone's interested, the um, third weekend, I had to date some. Darn it. I don't know the dates offhand. 21 to 23. That's the ones. Thank you, Jeremy. 20, the <laughs> April 21 through 23, we'll be doing a trip up to Cherry Springs. Um, we'll be staying at the Big Dipper Lodge. And right now we are at half capacity. So there's still some spots left if you're interested in coming up. Uh, the price was incorrectly announced early on. It's actually $82 for the whole weekend. So if anyone's interested, just go out to the website. You can find all the information there. Feel free to contact me. And, um, you know, I can help work out any questions you may have. Really excited about this. Is, uh, if the skies are great up there and we have a, a field all to ourselves and we're able to, uh, you know, this should be a good time. A couple of nights of great stargazing. And thanks for setting this up. Okay, and astrophotography. Uh, Lou couldn't be here, but Joe's going to stand in for him. Joe Lamb. Tim. Hello. Well, except for new word for Bill, uh, for Lou. Um, I just want to mention that the astrophotography enthusiasts in the group, we have a Zoom meetings once a month. And they usually occur about two days before the general meeting. So we have one last Wednesday night. The next one is scheduled for April 12th. And anyone who would like to join and sit in on the Zoom meeting, uh, you're welcome. And you don't need to be, uh, you know, have that much expertise in astrophotography. Everyone is welcome. You know, not everyone, no one in the group knows everything. We all learn from each other. So we would love to have you if you are interested. So April 12th is the next one. Um, there is a Zoom invitation. If you go to dvaa.org and look at the event schedule and look on that particular date, you'll see the link. So thank you very much. I guess attending that workshop will be a great follow-up for anyone coming tomorrow. Um, tomorrow is all the beginner stuff, and then you follow up with the with the Zoom meeting. Okay, so now I'd like to turn things over to our program chair, Jeremy. All right, thanks, Jen. Actually, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, give a little preview of some upcoming uh, programs. We've got actually quite a bit of the year uh, fleshed out already. So let's see, uh, talk about some of the upcoming ones. In April, we're going to have Michelle Thaler back. So she uh, presented to us over Zoom uh, during uh, COVID. Uh, she'll be uh, not here. We're not planning on that. I think she'll be over Zoom, but we'll be meeting in this room here. So I think she'll be presenting some of the latest results from Web. So the last time she presented was a matter of like, is it not long after Web uh, launched? Maybe a month or two after. So now she'll be talking about some of the actual uh, science. In May, we're going to have John Honka, who's a member of the Chesmont Club. Uh, if you've been to Blue Mountain, you've probably seen him there or his 24-inch uh, scope. So he's going to talk about some of his adventures in telescope making. Got an 18 inch, a 24 inch. He's been uh, playing around with night vision equipment. So he's got a lot of really cool stuff to uh, talk about. In June, we're going to have Steve Connard. So you may remember him. He's the guy who uh, worked on the New Horizons mission. So he told us about the Pluto flyby and then about the flyby of Arakoff, uh, which was then known as Ultima Thule. So he'll be back to tell us about the latest things that he's been working on. In July, we'll have Ray Harris, who's a member of the Lehigh Valley Club. And he's going to be talking about star charts and celestial cartography to be a little bit different topic. In August, we're going to have a guy who I think uh, needs no introduction, uh, Harold, our former president. And he's going to give us a presentation. Uh, it's about Shakespeare and poetry and uh, some kind of interesting stuff there. Now, the other thing is August is actually going to be a twofer. Uh, this is a blue moon special because, you know, the uh, actually this could be our observing talk. Uh, the lunar month runs 29 and a half days. Uh, the calendar month runs about 30 to 31 days. So we try to schedule our meetings around the full moon to try to avoid uh, dark sky uh, periods. So you may notice like the meetings tend to get earlier and earlier every month and eventually get sort of a, a place where either we have to have two meetings in one month or we have a really big gap. So it turned out there was a really big gap between uh, August and September. So we're going to get a double meeting in there on August 25th. And that'll be an astronomy fair at Fort Washington State Park. 
for something a little bit different. And that was uh, actually quite successful the last time we did it. Uh, finally, in September, we're going to have our returning champion, John Conrad, who's going to be back for another talk. And he's actually got a brand new talk on the OSIRIS-REx mission which is a sample return mission, which uh, picked up some uh, materials from the asteroid Bennu. So he's actually gonna be here on September 22nd and OSIRIS-REx is scheduled to return to earth and return those samples on September 24th. So two days later, so that's uh, very timely. Uh, that's all I have so far. <laughs> I think we'll wait a little bit. So uh, for uh, scheduling the rest of the year. So for tonight, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dylan Paré. He's a postdoc at Villanova University, actually just started here uh, in the last year or so. So Dylan did his PhD in physics at the University of Iowa. And prior to that, he did his BS in physics at UMass Amherst. So Dylan's uh, specialties are radio and infrared studies, uh, particularly of the galactic center. He's gonna tell us a little bit about the work that he's been doing. So please join me in uh, welcoming Dylan Paré. over here. There. Yeah. Okay. Do you want the mic? Um, well, actually, I think I'll just use that. Oh. That's all right. Yeah. All right. And then is this like a pointer? That I yeah, so it's the, yeah, the down arrow is what goes ahead. It's the okay. opposite of what you think. And if you could uh, okay. get on the camera. Uh, yeah, Flip so like more in front. Like this, maybe, or you want to? There you go. All right, yeah. awesome. Thanks. Well, hello, hello everyone. Uh, I actually started as an amateur astronomer back in high school. I still have like the six inch equatorial that I used back in the day, uh, which I still use every now and then, although it's uh, can be difficult to use it around here with all the light we have. But uh, it's cool to be able to present on what I'm doing now. Uh, to a group like what I attended back back in the day. So thank you all for having me today. Um, so the region I study is the Galactic Center. And um, I kind of want to start by outlining, uh, let me switch the slides. I want to start by outlining uh, just what the Galactic Center is, why it's an interesting region to study, some of the complexities of studying it. And um, my my particular expertise is more on looking on uh, at like the magnetic fields of the region. So I'll talk a bit about what we see uh, regarding magnetic fields over a range of scales in the galactic center. And then I'll talk specifically about these structures um, known as the non-thermal filaments, which are these uh, radio structures that I spend a lot of time looking at as well. So to orient us uh, where the galactic center is, this yellow arrow indicates where we are in the galaxy and the galactic center is the center of the Milky Way. So it's a relatively nearby astronomical object, um, more, more distant than a lot of like the stars you would look at, but in terms of like distant galaxies, this is a much closer uh, target than something like that. And the relative Nearness to Earth is what makes this region interesting because this is the only nuclear region of a galaxy that we can observe in high detail, uh, since the other ones are orders of magnitude further away. However, if you were to look at the region in the optical, you would see something like this. Um, it's obscured by a lot of dust. Uh, so using an optical telescope, you can't really get a sense of what is going on in this region, even though it's a very bright region. So what we have to do is we have to go to non-optical wavelengths, specifically something like the infrared, which is what I'm showing here, where you still see some dust, but you can also start to see the emission from what's actually in the center of the galaxy. And if you look at radio and X-ray, you can also pick out some of the features of the galactic center. And so I'll just I'll just briefly go over uh, different ways that people have studied this region. I'm not going to talk in detail about each and every one of these, but just to quickly highlight um, that there are a, a number of ways we can study 
uh, also the, the galactic center. So we can look at spectral lines in the radio. I've included some of the examples here. Uh, we can also look at um, these recombination lines that tell us about hotter gas, like ionized gas, uh, that are near like large stars like type O or type B stars. Uh, we can look at, rather than spectral lines, just like the total intensity or continuum emission in the radio. That's like an ex this, um, this uh, lower panel here is, represents some of that continuum radio emission. And I'll be talking more about this emission later. And then in the infrared as well, uh, you can look at star forming regions. So those are some uh, examples here in this panel. I'll revisit this figure in more detail later. Uh, and then also at far infrared, uh, you can look at uh, radiation emitted from or re-radiated from starlight, uh, look at magnetic fields in that way as well. So I'll be revisiting the far infrared when I talk more about magnetic fields a little bit later. So, um, oh, and then also the X-ray, right? So the X-ray is the higher energy, lets us look at um, some of the emission from like the black hole, for example, or from some of the higher energy stars that are in the region. So I wanted to showcase one of the recent results coming out of observations of the Galactic Center. Uh, this was in the news recently where we were able to look at, see if I can look at features of the central black hole of the galaxy. And the way this was done was they used uh, telescopes throughout the earth. That's what I show in that lower panel there. And basically using these telescopes scattered around the earth, they were able to make a telescope that had like the um, aperture of the size of the earth. That was how they were able to actually see some of the details of the black hole. And so this is a cool region to look at to give us a sense of like what black holes look like, what impact they have on galaxy formation. So before going into more of the topic of what I'll be um, discussing today, I wanted to showcase this recent result that's been coming out. So to talk a little bit about some of the larger scale features of the galactic center, it's a very dense region with a lot of molecular gas. Um, and it's this kind of gas um, that would obscure us or, or prevent us from observing it in the optical, but we can study some of the properties in the galactic center uh, using infrared and radio. And so I'll be, I'll be focusing mainly on infrared and radio in this talk. Uh, and so one of the results that has come out over the last few years is that the molecular uh, population within the galactic center has this like figure eight infinity symbol shape within the galactic center. And it's thought that this is like a spiral in the center of the galaxy where uh, it's essentially orbiting around the central black hole at this large scale. And as it orbits, it produces um, like the density enhancements produce stars. Uh, so that's the thought of how like star formation occurs within the galactic center is through this large orbital structure that it seems like these structures follow. And then this is a highlight of what we can see looking in the infrared and X-ray. Uh, so the yellow and red um, color here is infrared data of the Galactic Center taken using the Hubble telescope. And these uh, features are star forming regions. You can see they have these like thread like structures. There's this structure here that looks like a sickle possibly. And so there's clearly a lot of complex structure within this region where stars are forming and there's interaction happening between different gas populations. And so this has led to a lot of studies on what could be occurring in the galactic center, why there are all these crazy interactions going on in this region. And then we also have the blue emission in this figure, which is X-ray. So that's higher energy. And so some of the like X-ray intense regions are covering like this. This is a bright star cluster with a lot of young stars. Uh, this is the location of the central black hole, Sagittarius A star, which a lot of X-rays come out of. Um, and so there's a lot of different energetic questions about um, 
you know, how the high energies of the region could impact processes like star formation and what that can tell us about how the Milky Way formed or was evolved over the last you know, few billion years. So one of the sources of energy within the region are these bright or uh, young star clusters, like I mentioned, like this is one of them. There are a few clusters like this in the region where they are comprised of younger stars like type O, type B stars um, that emit a lot of this radiation that provides energetics in the region. So one element to uh, considering how the, mag how the galactic center impacts our larger sense of galaxy formation and evolution is one of magnetic fields. And uh, magnetic fields have been known theoretically for a long time to play an important role in properties like star formation and galaxy formation. But uh, observations of magnetic fields have historically been a challenge because of resolution limits. And it's a complex question to answer about how, how do you study the magnetic field of a distant object? And um, observations have been coming out the last few decades, which have helped corroborate or disprove various theories. So we're starting to have more observations that help us answer the question of what the actual role of magnetic fields could be in the universe. And one, one area of study is to look at some of the distant galaxies, the extragalactic targets, to see how magnetic fields function at the large scale. So this lower figure here, uh, it shows a, 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 a total intensity optical image of this galaxy NGC 4631. And then these white dashed lines indicate the magnetic field orientation. <clears throat> and you can see that it's especially towards the center of the galaxy, largely oriented uh, vertically. So oriented away from the galactic plane. And the thought is, <clears throat> that the magnetic field could be pushing energy away from the galaxy into its halo. So that could be a way that energy is transported out of the galaxy. And then if you look at, at, a, at a face on galaxy where you can see the galactic disk, like with this target here, 1097, uh, it's seen that a magnetic field uh, generally traces the orientation of the spiral arms of the galaxy. So there's like this vertical field that we see in this halo, and then a more parallel field that traces the disk. But with observations like these, because of the large distances, we can't really tell what's going on in the centers of these galaxies. So how does the how does the galactic center field connect to something like the halo field that we see here or the disk field? Um, can that help explain how energy is transported throughout the galaxy as a whole? And the only way we can really do that, uh, at least currently, is looking at our own galactic center because of how much closer it is. And so this was a, um, a relatively recent study of the large scale magnetic field of the galactic center. This was done using radio wavelengths. And um, so the, the color scale here is showing the emission from the radio. And then it's a, little, it's a little difficult to see with the projector, but there are a lot of these black dashed lines that indicate the magnetic field orientation in the galactic center. And it largely traces these kind of spiral structures that we see uh, that are in the red. Um, and it's largely oriented vertically to the galactic plane, which is oriented like this. And that seems to corroborate what we see with edge on galaxies where that could indicate that the magnetic field in the galactic center is connecting to the larger galactic halo field. And so that again, could be transporting energy out of the galaxy into the halo. But this is a, a lower resolution observation, and we want to see if we can look at some of the higher resolution details um, of whether that's actually the case. And one reason we want to do that is that if we look at the molecular clouds, you can get 
a magnetic field through a separate metric by looking at the molecular clouds by measuring basically what the magnetic field is that threads through these molecular structures. And the thought is, well, that field system should agree with what we see in the radio because we shouldn't have magnetic fields with different orientations in the same region. But we do see a different magnetic field. Um, this uh, kind of uh, wavy feature in this figure traces the orientation of the magnetic field from the infrared dust polarization. And this, um, this plane of, of brighter, redder features is essentially the galactic plane. And this magnetic field does not have this vertical orientation that we were seeing in the radio. It actually seems to be more parallel to the galactic disk, like what we were seeing uh, with like face on galaxies. And so this has been a question now for a few years where people have wondered how the radio and infrared magnetic fields could connect. Why is it that they don't agree in this region? Uh, there have been a few theories proposed to explain how this discrepancy could be, but so far observationally, there hasn't been a good way to corroborate it. Uh, and so that's, sorry, uh, that's some of my, uh, work, which I'll get to in a bit, but I also want to talk about some of the higher resolution observations uh, prior to my own work that have made an effort to follow up on some of this research. And so uh, these were observations, again, in the infrared, where they're looking at individual molecular clouds within the galactic center. So what I showed earlier uh, were observations covering essentially the entire galactic center, and now the focus is to see uh, how do magnetic fields within individual clouds behave? Do they agree with what's been seen on the larger scales? And so these red vectors here um, indicate, again, the orientation of the magnetic field. This is for a specific molecular region. And while, while the magnetic fields are generally uniform, the orientations do vary, even within this small region. And if you look at even finer scales, so this, this um, red rectangle marks the region of these other panels here. So they're looking at even higher regions to really try and probe. Um, oh, should I, should I pause? No, 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 please go on. Okay. Um, so this is an effort to look at even finer scales about what's really happening in the magnetic field within these molecular regions. And so these red dashes, are these magnetic field lines from this uh, larger image here. And the, the yellow dashes are even finer scale. And you can see at the small scales, the magnetic field is relatively chaotic with the orientation changing all over the place within a given cloud. Um, and so one thought is that um, this is a very dynamic region with a lot of uh, molecular motion and turbulence. So it could be that in molecular regions, the turbulence of the region causes the magnetic field to get sheared or warped uh, compared to what we see with like the radio emission. Um, but we need to do a bit more work to study that in more detail, see if that's actually the case. And this is, again, another example of the kind of complex magnetic fields we're seeing at smaller scales in this region, where this looks to have like a spiral or loop type of magnetic field that encircles the structure. And this is like a, a representation of that magnetic field using infrared data, where like this wavy feature, uh, like before, traces the magnetic field. Um, and so how do, how do finer scale features like this compare to the larger magnetic fields that we're seeing uh, from like some of the earlier figures that I show? Um, and then I'll, I'll just include this as yet a smaller scale example, just to indicate that we can go to pretty small scales here uh, in studying the region. So, I want to return to the radio side of things because my um, radio is more my expertise and uh, a lot of work has been done to study some of the finer scale molecular magnetic fields that try and help answer this question, but not as much has been done in the radio to try and see if we can get answers from this side of things. So this was a, 
uh, an image uh, taken from Meerkat, which is in uh, South Africa, where they covered the entire center of the galaxy. And this is really impressive image. I, uh, uh, I'll admit that I've spent a lot of time looking at this figure because of all the features that we see. And uh, these like brighter regions are molecular regions uh, that trace or, or are located on the galactic plane. But at the, at the radio, what I want to point out in, in detail are these various like thread-like string structures that we see. And these are known as the non-thermal filaments. Um, so far, they've only been detected within the galactic center of these threads. And it's unclear, uh, it's unclear why they only show up in this region. Uh, but we can use these structures to get a, a sense of the magnetic field. And one of the one of the ways we can do that, if my slide oh, would advance. Sorry, I stole the focus okay. away. Yeah, so cool. Um, so one of the one of the ways we can use these structures is um, we found that they trace magnetic fields. So this is an example of some of these thread-like structures that are near the black hole. This is the location of the black hole of the Milky Way. And if we look at an example of these uh, filaments, uh, this is like the total intensity. So like what we would see from the radio image, just like the total, like just the you know, visibility of the structure, but we can also pull out the polarized light and we see that it's highly polarized. And, and this is a representative filament. All of these filaments have high polarizations. And we can use this technique in radio astronomy to extract uh, what the magnetic field is local to this filament if it's polarized. And that's what I'm showing in this lower panel here with these um, dashed lines. Um, it's a little hard to see on the projector, but the magnetic field in the filament uh, traces the total intensity orientation. Um, so this was an unpublished work, but um, this is a published result that shows the same, uh, the same features with the polarized intensity uh, local to the total intensity and it has a strong magnetic field. So if we look, uh, so all of the non-thermal filaments exhibit these properties. So if we look at how the non-thermal filaments are oriented with respect to the galactic plane, uh, that's what the sketch is showing where this dashed line is the plane of the galaxy. That's the, uh, that star is the central black hole. We can see that the filaments are, are generally perpendicular. So that again, hints at this vertical magnetic field that we were seeing earlier um, in that first image I showed. But we can use these non-thermal filaments to look at this, um, to look at the magnetic field from the radio in more detail now. And so that's where some of this more recent work comes in and we're also where my work comes in, which I'm getting to in a little bit. So this was a paper from last year uh, where they targeted a number of these individual filaments within the galactic center. And you can see that there are a ton of these filamentary structures throughout the region. And in this paper, they didn't yet look at the magnetic field or polarized intensity. Um, this was like a preliminary paper where they were building a catalog of these structures essentially for follow-up like polarimetric magnetic field analysis. Uh, and then this is a, a showcase of some of these structures in that larger uh, meerkat image I showed earlier. You can see that they're located throughout the galactic center. Most of them are perpendicular, but we have a lot of the filaments that are oriented at strange angles. And we thought like this X kind of shape here. Uh, so that could, uh, that kind of already indicates some of the complexity that could be going on in the magnetic field if these structures are all tracing magnetic fields. And so in addition to the magnetic field aspect of this, because we only see these filaments in this region, it's led to a lot of questions about like, well, why do they only show up in the galactic center? Uh, can, can the existence of these structures give us a better sense of what the history of the galactic center is, which might in turn tell us something about the energetics or dynamics of how galaxies form and evolve as well. 
Um, and you know, one of the questions that I'm interested in as well is do these filaments exist in other galactic centers and we just don't have the resolution yet to see them? Um, there's no reason, I think, to assume that the Milky Way is a special galaxy. So I would think naively that we would see filaments like this in other nuclear regions. Um, and I'll revisit that point towards the end of the talk. But hopefully, as we get better and better instruments, we might be able to pick out some of these structures in other galaxies as well. So I'll now get into my own work on these filaments. Um, we kind of refer to them as these NTFs. That's like the acronym we use for them. So I'll talk briefly at three different studies I've done. A lot of this was done when I was in graduate school. I haven't been at Villanova for too long. Um, and I'm in Villanova mainly looking at the infrared side of things now, but I still spend some time on the radio aspects of the Galactic Center. And so I am planning to do more work on this topic, but I'll just go over some of what I've done to date. So this was from uh, relatively early on in, in grad school. We were, uh, my advisor and I, we're looking at one of the brightest non-thermal filaments in the galactic center, that's this structure here. And you can see that it consists of quite a bit, quite a few of these filamentary features. Uh, we, we counted them as like over 20 individual filaments if you zoom in. Uh, so quite an impressive structure. It seems to interact with these um, H2 regions. And then we also noticed in our, images here that there's what looks to be this ring kind of structure that envelops the filaments. Uh, and that'll be important later when we look at the magnetic field. And that hasn't, that ring structure hadn't been observed before. So that was a new finding from this study. And uh, just to show the kind of detail we're able to get, this was data we got from the very large array in New Mexico. And if you zoom in, you can really pick out how narrow these filaments are that are within these structures. And we even see like these brightness knots within the filaments, which um, could be like star forming regions maybe or, or something else. And then this is a, a similar image at higher frequencies where we pick out some other bright regions and can also see how narrow the filaments are. And we have quite high resolutions in these images. So, um, we see a lot of interesting total intensity like brightness features, but we also wanna look at how the polarization of these structures behaved because again, that's how we get the magnetic field. And so this color scale here is showing us the polarization we get from this bright filament or filamentary feature. And we can see that it generally traces the total intensity, which are the contours here of the filaments, which is what we've seen in the other uh, non-thermal filament targets uh, in the galactic center. So that gave us confidence that, you know, we were correctly detecting the polarization from the structure versus it being, uh, you know, an, an incorrect detection or, or something like that. Um, and so in radio or at radio wavelengths, if you have a polarized target, you can use that polarization and study how it varies as a function of frequency which is what I'm showing here. It tends to be a linear trend as a function of frequency or wavelength. I'm showing it in terms of wavelength here. Um, and you can use that variation to get out how, how the magnetic field behaves. So that's what I'll show in this slide where um, the orientation of the filament is, is in black here. And we have all of these black vectors that indicate the orientation of the magnetic field. And like, um, like I showed earlier, a lot of the other filaments that have been studied in the Galactic Center have this uniformly parallel field where it closely traces the orientation of the filament. But that's not what we see with this structure. Um, I've marked these rectangular regions to indicate where the field is parallel. But these elliptical regions um, a trace where the magnetic field has a, an orientation. Like it's about a 60 degree orientation with respect to the filaments. And that's unprecedented. We haven't seen that 
in the other filaments in the galactic center. And so my advisor and I were like, well, we have to be wrong, right? <laughs> like, why, why are we getting these rotated regions? But we did a lot of checks and verifications of what we were getting out, and this seems to be real. So then we were like, okay, what's causing these rotated magnetic field regions? And so well, we spent a fair amount of time trying to figure this out, but what we eventually came to as kind of a preliminary theory for what's going on is if you look at where this filament is located, it's in the galactic plane. And I showed you um, earlier that we saw this, this shell uh, or yeah, the shell of emission that encompassed the filament. And that's again, what I'm showing here. And so our thought is that if the shell is interacting with the radio arc that could explain the regions of rotated magnetic fields. So our thought is that there are these structures, these enhancements in density, and in like a structure like this, that's between us and the filaments, that could be where we're seeing the rotated magnetic field. Um, but another, another explanation could be that the magnetic field in the filaments is just not as uniform as was previously thought because we have high resolution observations of this structure. Maybe we are actually revealing for the first time that these magnetic fields are not as ordered as we thought. And so that is what led us to follow up on this study. Yeah, by looking at, like, so we started by looking at this particular filament in more detail one of the um, strengths of studying magnetic fields in the radio is that you can cover it or um, observe it over a large frequency range. And the larger the frequency range you use, the better estimate you can make on the magnetic field. So those first observations I showed you had a four gigahertz frequency width. So we used an instrument in Australia to more than double that frequency range and this is some examples of the observations we get over uh, a subset of those frequencies. And the goal here was to see, okay, can we, using a higher frequency range, can we verify um, or improve what we were seeing before with the magnetic field? And so this is an example, again, of the kind of polarization that we were getting. Uh, this is at five gigahertz, relatively uh, not as much polarization. And then at higher frequency, we get a lot more polarization from the structure. And then um, this is what I'm showing uh, how the polarization varies as a function of wavelength squared, but it's over that one to 11 gigahertz range. And you can see one, one of the things we noticed is that it's not a linear trend. It has this um, sinusoidal uh, property and then the black line shows the total intensity where it's not like a linear decrease but almost like an exponential decay. So that can give us insight into what's going on uh, with what like what process is causing the magnetic field. Um, and uh, one thing, so I, I didn't include an image of it, but when we went and did the magnetic field or derived the magnetic field using this data, we have um, got the same results of the rotated magnetic field regions. So that seems to indicate that um, this is in fact a property <clears throat> that we're seeing with the radio arc, but it's still unclear whether it's the radio arc itself or a result of that shell that we saw. So to help, to help resolve whether it's the shell or a process of the filaments themselves, uh, I am now looking at a set of fainter filaments. So I've marked, I've marked uh, our observations of these structures here with the circles. And the idea is these structures are, consist of multiple filaments like the prominent um, filament I showed earlier, but they are not, you know, they're not affected by this shell emission feature. So the idea is if we look at the magnetic fields of these structures, again, with the high resolutions we had before, if we see these rotated magnetic field regions, it indicates that it's a, properties of, a property of these filaments. If not, then it could just be a, a, a property of the structure. And that gives us a sense of whether the magnetic field within the whole region is actually this ordered 
um, vertical feel, or if it's more complex. If it's more complex, that can explain why the infrared and radio at large scales don't agree um, like we would have thought otherwise. And so I'm just gonna show examples of the images that we're getting from our observations of these fainter filaments. I'm currently working on um, this, uh, this project. So what I've done is I've gone through and, and, and calibrated and verified the kind of brightness distributions we're getting, uh, but I haven't looked at the polarization side yet. So that's what I'm working on this year. So I'm not gonna show, unfortunately, the magnetic fields for these structures yet, but hopefully by the end of this year, I'll be able to do that. <clears throat> so this is the brightness we're getting from one of our structures. And you can see like with the radio arc or the brighter filament that I showed earlier, we have a lot of these individual filaments here. And we also see this cool feature of what looks to be a point source with like a, a jet or tail of emission that approaches the filaments. And as that jet uh, interacts or coincides with the filament, there's this brightness enhancement. So that gives us evidence of how these filaments could be interacting with other structures that are in the center of the galaxy. And um, I'm not going to go into it in this talk, but we can use the brightness enhancements we see here to determine whether the filaments are interacting with the, with the tail that we're seeing um, and um, whether the tail could be forming the filaments. Um, if you have questions on that, I can answer after the talk, but um, just for the sake of time, I didn't have time to go into it for the talk itself. And then this is one of our other structures and the filaments are quite faint, but you can see there's this brighter filament here that actually has a, a, a bend um, along its length. And then it's near this diffuse region, which we don't have a good sense of what this region actually is, <laughs> like whether it's a molecular region or an H2 region. We're still working on figuring out what the nature of the structure is. And we also pick up this other filament in our observations. We actually weren't, um, this was like a, a serendipitous detection. We weren't looking for this filament. It just happened to come up in our observations. So we were happy to have this other detection, this other structure that we could compare to. And then one of the, one of the contexts that I'll put to fit this work in is that a recent nature paper revealed that we're seeing these large scale outflow structures. So the galactic or um, the Milky, um, not the Milky Way, the black hole, that's what I'm trying to say. The black hole of the Milky Way is within this region here. And this is a, a radio image that seems to indicate that there, there are these large scale outflows coming out from the black hole where like material and energy could be transported from the galactic center into the halos. And um, if you overlay where the filaments are in the galactic center with the location of the structure, the filaments are actually either exactly on the edge of that structure or contained within it um, with a few exceptions, but this seems to indicate that the filaments are being formed by this outflow from the black hole, um, which would give us insight into the formation of how these structures um, came about and possibly why they only show up in the galactic center. But you would also expect if they're caused by this outflow that you would have a vertical magnetic field because the magnetic field would be pulled along the outflow. Um, so the idea is if, if I find a more uniform magnetic field, that would work to verify this theory that the filaments are caused or, or produced by the outflow. Whereas if it's a more chaotic field, like we saw for the radio arc structure, that might not be an appropriate theory for what's going on. And so I want to revisit some of the other work. So um, fortunately, the Galactic Center is a very collaborative community. So this author is doing similar work to I'm doing, but we don't really scoop each other. So that's nice. <laughs> Um, but he's looking at the non-thermal filaments um, throughout the galactic center region. And so he, like I, will be looking at some of the uh, polarimetric properties of the filaments 
Uh, this is from his recent paper where he looks more at the total intensity. And again, he's cataloging and quantifying some of their properties for follow-up analysis, like what I have been doing for the targets I'm studying. And so um, I think I skipped the slide there. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to briefly highlight um, what I'm doing at Villanova. So this, this is work I've done. The radio work is what I've done in grad school. And I've continued to do it on the side as a postdoc at Villanova. But the main research I do at Villanova now is looking at the infrared dust polarization. And the idea with this project is we're looking at the infrared at fine scales throughout the whole region. So kind of analogous to what I've been doing in the radio, where we have like arc second scale resolutions, but we're looking throughout the galactic center. And the idea here is to see if at finer scales, like we saw for individual clouds earlier in the talk, um, at finer scales, does the large scale magnetic field also show non-uniform features where it's more chaotic? Because that'll help us explain how these different field systems could potentially connect. And I just wanted to point or highlight the fact that we used the uh, SOFIA telescope, which is on a Boeing 747. At least it was until it was decommissioned. <laughs> but uh, that was cool to use this instrument here and uh, fly on an airplane without like traveling somewhere, but to like take data. That was, that was a fun experience. Uh, so I just want to conclude with some of like the exciting possibilities that are coming up as we improve some of the radio instruments that we have. So there are improvements planned for the VLA, which is in New Mexico. The uh, upgraded VLA is called the Next Generation VLA, and it will consist of an order of magnitude a better resolution. Uh, and there are other upgrades for some of the other radio instruments that we have. And then there's the square kilometer array that Australia and other countries have been working to complete. And one thing I'm excited about, uh, it's possible that with these new facilities and upgrades to facilities that, like I mentioned earlier, we might be able to probe more of the features of these um, nuclear regions within other galaxies to see if they also have the filaments that we're seeing in our own galactic center. And it'll also be cool to see, are they oriented in the same way? Are they generally perpendicular to the galactic plane like we see in ours? And that can help give us a more unified picture of how these central regions connect to, you know, what we know about galactic disks and galactic halos. And so that is my last slide. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll take questions if there are any. And thank you so much for having me. Can I start with the internet from Jody Brody? How do you actually measure the polarization? I do single molecule research and use parallel and perpendicular fluorescence to calculate or determine polariz polarization on a molecular basis, I think it's the Right, right. So there are different methods for doing it, depending on whether it's radio or infrared. Um, I, I mainly talked about the radio, so I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, for the instruments that I use, um, there are uh, polarization receivers uh, where you can have like, you can detect the, the, way, the light at one particular angle, and then there's another detector at like a 45 degree angle. Mm -hmm. And you look at the difference between the emission you get from <laughs> these particular angles to derive the polarization from your observations. So that's how the radio, um, the, the, that's in the basics of how the radio instruments detect polarization from these objects. <clears throat> and then since that, that didn't take very long, the infrared um, is actually done in a similar way where it has these two different angles that it looks at. And you take the sum and difference between those different angles, the emission you get from them to derive the polarization. Thank you. Yep. If I understood you right, um, you're, you're looking at polarization of the light to see what the magnetic field is, right? 
Um, yeah, so right, we use we use the polarization. Um, that's what allows us to determine the magnetic field. So if these structures weren't polarized, we wouldn't be able to do that. I guess my question is how strong a magnetic field is polarized by yeah, so in the astronomical context, magnetic fields tend to not be very strong. So you can pick up polarization from uh, cosmological objects with magnetic field strengths that are estimated to be in the microgauss. Um, these filamentary structures, the, the magnetic field strength has been estimated, and it's actually a bit of a stronger magnetic field in the galactic center at more like um, hundreds of microgauss or even milligauss in some cases, but that's that's a high magnetic field for astronomical objects, gen generally it's speaking. Related that I was just wondering, any given area of the sky that looks like how polarized the light coming from this star is. From a star specifically, or like just in general? Um, yeah, so there's there has been work done to look at like, um, like you can get polarization even from the CMB even like, so the cosmic microwave background, which is this low intensity signal, people have been looking at the polarization from it. That's not easy because of how faint it is, but it's possible to even get polarization from like fainter targets like that. Um, there's a question behind you, yeah. How does the Earth's magnetic field interfere with your observations of distant magnetic fields? Right, so, there's a lot of correction factors that go into what I what I showed here. Um, so there are models that we use to account for like the Earth's magnetic field, but we also need to account for the passive magnetic field in the galactic disk. Like I showed in extra galactic, we see that there's a magnetic field in the disk and we're looking through our own galactic disk to do these observations. So we have to do some modeling, which is done on previous observations of like the Earth's magnetosphere or the Milky Ways to correct out for those other effects that we're not interested in. And it's, um, we're pretty confident about the estimates we made, but that's one of the reasons, um, that's one of the reasons we did the higher frequency study that I showed, because the higher the frequency range you have, the better able uh, your um, the better able you are to model some of those other effects as well. Um, so that was one of the ways we we attempted to verify that we were correcting for these other effects. Yeah. Another question from the internet: What role, if any, 